in Jesus' name. Lord, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for the service we have we've had today. Thank you for the preaching that has been done today. Thank you for so winning. Thank you, Lord. They help us, Lord, to be not just hearers of your word, but doers of your word, not to look ourselves in the mirror and forget what we look like, but to walk in your ways, O Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. Lord, as I preach, O Lord, fill me with your spirit. Help me, O Lord, not to preach of myself, but of you, O Lord, to be able to edify your people and leave an impact to someone today in Jesus' name. Amen. Open our Bibles to First Peter chapter 2. First Peter chapter 2, First Peter 2, I read, First Peter 2, I read from verse 1, I'm oh, sorry, First Peter chapter 2, I read from verse 19, it says, For this is thankworthy, that, um, for this is thankworthy, if a man for conscience towards God endure grief, suffering wrongfully, for what glory is it if when ye be buffeted for your fault, ye take it patiently? But if when ye do well and suffer for it, ye take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. You can open your Bibles to Romans chapter 5. Um, someone told me the other day that it seems like this Christian life is about, you know, suffering. There's a lot of suffering involved in this Christianity. And Yes, there is. I mean, Christ did promise us that we're going to have, um, you know, neighbors, we're going to have sisters, we're going to have um, houses, but everything with persecution. So persecution comes with everything. Tribulation comes with everything. But not only tribulation, there's also affliction, there's also, you know, punishments too for the sins that we do. So there's one side of suffering that it's like David, where you're suffering for losing your child or temporarily losing the kingdom during the time of Absalom um, for the sins that you committed. So pretty much suffering for your own sin. And there's the other side, like the way you're like Joseph, for conscience towards God, you choose not to sin, but still yet you're being afflicted, you're being troubled, and that one is pleasing to God. So you're in Romans chapter 5. So God expects us that when we are going through tribulations, when we're going through suffering, especially the ones that we, that we didn't do for uh, because of our fault, that we should take it patiently. Um, Romans chapter 5, I read from verse 3, And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope, and hope maketh not ashamed, because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. So keep your, uh, keep your Bibles there in Romans chapter 5. So, all the suffering we go through as Christians, according to this verse, is all the uh, all the suffering we go through is to build experience. The tribulations uh, it's to work patience and patience experience is to gain experience in this Christian life. So you can kind of say like to get experience in this Christian life, you need to go through some suffering. You need to go through some hard times. You need to go through, go through some problems to gain experience in this Christian life. And if you think about it. It kind of also applies in our secular jobs, like to gain experience in your secular job, to move up the ladder, to grow, to get more pay. You do have to go through some difficult times. You do have to be able to be responsible for some difficult scenarios where you came through in the end and you built experience. That's why job, job, um, jobs usually ask for you know, how many years experience do you have? Because by the number of experience you have, they used to gauge whether you can handle more tax or not. So as Christians, we should also, we, there's a need for us to have work experience as a Christian. And because the Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, it says, For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. God, God, Jesus, God got us saved and we are, yeah, after getting us saved, he has created works for us to walk in them, to get experience in them, so jobs for us to do, to gain experience. Um, the title of my sermon today is Gaining Work Experience as Christian. There's going to be several relations to our normal work, um, just to try to make it practical to our own Christian lives. Um, so I don't know if you have ever applied for you know a job where you know they ask for this crazy amounts of um, work experience when you just either getting started or maybe you even ask for you are applying for a job where the experience you've had doesn't even apply in any ways to the new job that you're getting. That's kind of like 
kind of put it like a similarity with Christianity like that, where it's like we have all this work experience in our, in our past lives, and when we're trying to get saved, we bring all that to the table, and God is like, no, no, this is all nothing. This does not apply. This does not carry over. And it's like, you know what, the only way, I'll give you the job, but the only way I'm giving you the job is by grace. And it's like your work is trash, but I'll, you, through grace, you get this job. And that's how, um, that's how we are getting the, again, this, I'm making an example, but it doesn't fit perfectly. Because if you get fired at work, I mean, God does not fire you and make you lose your salvation. But you get the sense. Um, so the question might be asked, so why, why, do, why, would I, why do I need work experience? Like, can't I just get hired and just, you know, let like get like sit back and get paid and you know get all the benefits of a job or can't i just get saved and not do anything let me just chill and just keep doing things the way i've been doing things um i have two points to that um, i have two points to why we need work experience as christian my first point is because it is our reasonable service Romans chapter 12 verse 1 says, I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice wholly acceptable unto God which is your reasonable service. And why is it a reasonable service? First of all, you know, God expects us to actually present our body to live only to, you know, because he's talking about after we get saved. So to talk about why, you know, why is it our reasonable service, you're there in Romans chapter 5, I read from verse 6. Romans chapter 5, I read from verse 6. Uh, for when we were yet without strength, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. For scarcely for a righteous man will one die. Yet peradventure for a good man some would even dare to die. But God commended his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more then, being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. So we are under the wrath of God. We are, the, we, we, are, we are going to get the wrath of God if Christ did not die for our sins. Verse 10 says, For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. So Jesus Christ has done all this work for us. It's like, kind of like, a slave that is going to they are, they are, they are about to kill a slave and god look and uh, someone looks at that slave and is like you know what i'm going to pay for that slave and i'm going to pay for that slave now imagine that slave getting paid for then going around and just going to the master's house and just chilling and not wanting to do any work um romans chapter 6 verse 1 says what shall we say then shall we continue in sin that grace may abound it says god forbid how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? The thing about life is that you all, you're always working. Before you got saved, you were working. You were doing the works of the flesh. You were doing all the filthiness of this life. And when you got saved, you are still, there's still a work being done. Whether it work towards God or you're still working as if you were working for your old boss. And if you go to Romans chapter 6 verse um, 10, it says, For in that he died... He died unto sin once, but in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourself to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin reign therefore in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lost year of. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourself unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for ye are not under the law, but under grace. What, what then shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace. Bible says, God forbid, know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself servants to obey, is servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, of obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that ye were servants of sin, but ye have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. So we were servants of sin before we got saved. Now that you're, sa you are now that you're saved, you have a new boss. It's like before you had an old boss. Now imagine, to make it practical, imagine you you have this you had seven years in photography you were this bad guy with so many photography skills then you 
move and change your job and got hired in a construction field. Then you go to the construction site and you're using your photography on the work site. Instead of using the hammer, you're taking pictures of the hammer. Instead of doing things that the, your new boss is expecting you to do, you are still obeying the law of your old boss. All the things that your old boss required of you, you are applying it to the new one. The, I mean, if the new boss will probably be very... I mean, even the thought of that doesn't make sense. But that's how we as Christians sometimes are when we still choose to follow our old ways when we have new things that God has set, uh, set, um, set for us to do. So we are servants of righteousness. We are servants to do good. We are, we are under the law. On, we are under the law unto Christ. Um, oh, let's oh, open your Bibles to Joshua chapter seven. Joshua chapter seven. Um, so it's so it's not acceptable to get saved and not grow. It's not acceptable to get saved and not get a work uh, any add any experience to your work uh, your work in the Christian life. You ought to do work because it's your reasonable service. My second point is it hurts your neighbor, brethren, and the church if you choose not to. You know, if you choose not to walk in the Christian life, if you choose not to grow, if you just choose to sit down there and not do anything. So Joshua chapter 7, uh, this is the story of Jerry, um, Joshua and the Israelites going to attack a small town, Ai, um, a small town, and they thought they were going to be able to defeat them, and 36 of them died, and they chased them back. So you can open to um, Joshua 7, verse 20. And Joshua was confused and disturbed, and he was praying to God, God, you know, why would you bring us all the way over Jordan to get destroyed? And God's like, hey, man, someone has sinned, and that person that sinned was Achan. Let's read what he did. Um, Joshua chapter 7, verse 20. Um, I read, And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed I have sinned against the Lord, God of Israel, and thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a goodly Babylonish garment, 200 shekels of silver, and a wedge of gold of 50, 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent, and silver under it, and the silver under it. So Joshua sent messengers, and they ran unto the tent, and behold, it was hidden in his tent, and the silver under it. And they took them out of the midst of the tent, and brought unto Joshua, and unto all the children of Israel, and laid them out before the Lord. And Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, and the silver, and the garment, and the wedge of gold, and his sons, and his daughters, and his oxen, and his asses, Wow, and his sheep and his tent and all that he had, and they brought them unto the valley of Achor. And Joshua said, Why hast thou troubled us? The Lord shall trouble thee this day. And all Israel stoned him with stone and burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And see, this guy committed his own sin privately. Interesting enough. We all know that, you know, you shouldn't lie to you. You shouldn't lie to your neighbor. You shouldn't, you know, gossip. You shouldn't, you know, speak bad about somebody else. You shouldn't insult someone else. You, those are open sins. You should do good. So the open sins, you shouldn't do, or clearly you shouldn't do them. But we also know that we shouldn't do the private sins. You know, the one of not reading your Bible, the ones of not praying, the ones of coveting, all those private sins that nobody knows about. So, and this story tackles the private sin that nobody knew about that sin. It was between him and his family and apparently his asses and his ships. And so all this, all this, all this happened and not just him paid for it. Everybody is paid for it. The first of all, the 36 men that died when they went to fight the war and all his household paid for it. And this shows that it's kind of like Going back to um, the construction example, imagine a worker gets into a company and says, "You know what? I'm just not going to do anything. I'm just, I'm just going to be going to train up to work every day. He's not doing any research at home on what he's doing, what's supposed to be doing for work. He's not making any advance, advan uh, advancement to grow in his knowledge. He's not remembering what is being taught at work. He's not practicing it. He's not, he's not." It's not, I wanted to use um, carpentry term, sparkle. I'm sure many people know how to you know about joint compound. So it's not going and checking, you know, when it comes back to work again, practice how to sparkle. It's not doing any of that. And, but whenever it comes to going to work, oh, he shows up at work. He shows up every morning, day and night, he shows up, but he's not doing anything needed for him to grow. 
that is not only just going to hurt him, it will hurt his boss, it will hurt uh, the income, the profits, it's going to hurt his co-workers because they, 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 are, they are expecting to work, they, are, they will have to be coming around to fix his mistakes, they have to be, no one wants to talk to him, it's going to make the name of the company stink just because he's not doing what he needs to do to grow himself. Because when he grows himself in his own private life, it will affect the company. The uh, company will make more profits. The company will get more things done. His co-workers will love to work with him because you know he's helping them get their own work done too. But if he doesn't grow himself, he's bringing people down, and people are now even make, uh, fixing his mistakes. And that also applies to like you know being in the church. You can be showing up to church every day, be there where people are. But if you're not doing any personal thing to grow yourself, to grow yourself privately. You, your conversations are not going to be spiritual. You're, you know, you're not going to be able to engage in um, um, in f spiritual conversations. You're not going to be able to edify someone that needs help in terms of advice. You're not going to have any experience that you've successfully, like, as a carpenter, you know, is you okay you work on your sparkle job you get good at that you work on your framing job you get good at that so there's a level that you keep growing and they keep trusting you more you move from apprentice to carpenter from carpenter lead carpenter then you move to project manager but if you stay as a laborer not even an apprentice if you just stand as a laborer no one is ever going to come to ask you for advice no one will ever come to ask you for hey how can you help me grow how can how can i get better this because everybody can obviously see that you are not getting better you just love where you love where you are so there's a need for you to grow add experience to your life as a Christian it, not just even for yourself but even for the people that you're around your brethren your neighbors at work every everybody around you if you're a good and pleasant person to be uh, um, if you're following the laws of God I mean and if you really check it when you're doing the laws of God when you're at work you stand out in a sense you stand out differently you react to situations differently than your co 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 co-workers are would do so that is not only helping that's not only helping you but it's also helping people around you so those are the one of the two big reasons why you need um work experience as a christian now i'm going to now go to um six tools that we'll need six tools that we have to gain to do the job right to do the job perfectly six tools that god has given us again like a construction field you have tools already you have tools for you to get a job done you need tools and god has given us i would say six tools i'm sure you can pull up more but i'll say six tools and the first tool here would be the word of god the bible we have the bible so joshua chapter 1 uh, 1 verse 8 says this book of the law shall not depart out of my mouth but thou shalt meditate there in day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein for then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and then thou shalt have good success so you have this tool to make your way prosperous you have this tool to make have good success this tool covers everything because the word of god there's so many applications in the word of god that will help you out in your daily life so the word of god is a tool that god has preserved for us in the King James Bible. And the second tool you have is the Holy Spirit. You know, the Holy Spirit is a tool that God has given us to get several work done in our lives. Um, John chapter 16 verse 13 says, Albeit when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself. Whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So it's kind of like, the Holy Spirit is kind of like that boss that just knows the right answer to everything. It's like you are you're in a difficult scenario. Oh, what's this? I was like, Psh. yeah, this is it. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. You you are in a difficult, you have a hard problem. You're trying to figure out, oh, what does this Bible verse mean? Or how can I apply? How can I apply this verse into my life? Or how can I get better at something? You have the Holy Spirit. You pray to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will reveal the truth to you. So the Holy Spirit is that tool that we have in whatever job, uh, whatever work we need to do as a Christian. Third tool is prayer. The Bible says in John chapter 16, verse 24, Either too have ye asked nothing in my name, ask and ye shall receive that your joy may be full i mean there's so many verses about prayer 
prayer is not underestimated in Bible. Prayer is almost like everything. So we, prayer is the one great tool that we have that God, Jesus Christ himself, told you, if you want your joint to be full, just ask. Just whatever you need, have, having faith, not doubting, ask and you shall receive. So we do have that. Um, another tool we have, the fourth tool, is faithful brethren. There's a reason why we're going to a church, and in a church you are you you are to find faithful brethren. Luke chapter six, sixteen. Can I open your Bibles to First Timothy chapter three. Luke chapter sixteen. I read from verse ten. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in that which is least is unjust also in much. If therefore ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to you or trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is another man's, who shall give you that which, that which is your own? I mean, it's, this is a good verse because like, if you're not, if you're not faithful, again, applying to work, if you're not faithful in the little, nobody at work, your company is not going to give you much because they know you're going to screw it up. So it's only the guy that is faithful, showing up, getting the things done, learning that they commit more to. And same thing in church, you find someone that is faithful in doing the work, someone that is living according to the gospel, uh, according to the truth, someone that you can see that is a good picture of Christ, that's faithful brethren. And there are many people that are going through several things in church that are showing by their life that they are trusting God and God is getting them out of those scenarios. Those kind of people, you can, oh, wow, this guy was faithfully trusting God for this and God answered his prayer. I can go to him and, you know, t discuss about it and let him, let, you know, his testimony edify me. So this kind of thing, you have that as a tool in the church to get, um, to to increase your to to get jobs completed uh, as a Christian, the fifth point will be a living church. We are there in First Timothy, First Timothy chapter three. I read from verse fourteen. This thing fourteen. I read um, First Timothy chapter three, verse fourteen. These things write I unto you, hoping to come unto thee shortly. But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know that thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth. So you do have the church, which is the house of God, according to the Bible, and it says is the pillar and ground of the truth. How would you know what the pillar and ground, um, how would you know what the uh, pillar of ground and ground of truth is? When you find faithful brethren that, you know, preaching the right gospel, they are believing the right things, and when you find a church, a living church, you want to plug yourself into it. So that is a tool to help you grow, to help you do the works of God, to help you, at, you know, grow in Christ also, the preaching. So it's kind of like finding a company that they obey, follow the code, they, they have opportunity for growth. And that's the thing, that's the church. The church gives you opportunity for growth, gives you several areas that you can help out in, or even several areas where you can get edified in too. So that is a tool for you. And the Sixth tool and final tool is your body. Your body is a vessel for Christ. First Corinthians chapter twelve, I read from verse twenty-seven. Now ye are the body of Christ, the members and members in particular. And God has sent some in the church: first apostles, secondly prophets, thirdly teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, government, diversities of tongue, and diversities of tongue. It says your body. You need your body for the work. I mean, you need your body to actually do the work of God. So your body to new man. All that is you, you need to do the work. So uh, I'm going to try uh, wrap, uh, start around it and wrapping it up. In, the, in, con in construction, we have this term called the right tool for the, right, for the job. So you always want to use the right tool for the job. There are some tools that you will always need for a job, like a tape measure. You always need a tape measure to measure what you're going to go and cut and stuff like that. But there are some tools that you always need for a job. And that kind of tool is like, if I'm to take it spiritually, I would say like the prayer, the Bible, the Holy Spirit, you always need those tools for any job you're about to do. So you want to always access every scenario. Let's say you have a job that, oh, my, this job, this Christian work that I want to get an experience in is reading my Bible daily. How do, how do I get that done? You pray, you, you, you pray, you ask the Holy Spirit, you ask Him to help you, you read your Bible. I mean, even the Bible, reading your Bible will edify you to even keep reading the Bible more. So, but you don't start using, you know, um, the church try to read your Bible. You don't start using um, other, other exterior things to try to read your Bible. You're trying to use 
what God has provided you for, uh, to read the Bible. And James chapter 2 verse 14 says, What does it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of food, daily food, and daily food. So it's like you have someone in church that comes to you for something or uh, uh, comes for you for advice. You've gone through that same scenario. Instead of you offering advice, you're like just giving them a prayer. It's like, no, you're using the wrong tool for that job. Yeah, yeah, you, you should look at your life and look at the tools that you have. Oh, how about my own life? How about myself? All the things I've gone through. Can I say something that applies to this that God has helped me with to help this person? It's it's like if you remember the story of David, um, when David was presented in front of Saul, um, that's f f in Samuel, that David, um, David said, moreover, the Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of the Philistines. And Saul said unto David, go and the Lord be with you. So he has, he has work experience, the things that he has already done, jobs he has already completed, that he could say, this job, it's just going to be like that job. It's like, he said, you know, God has answered my prayers in the past. You know, he has revealed certain truths to me. He has given me the strength in an impossible scenario. scenario. What, what is this uncircumcised Philistines to it? It's kind of like, and that's the same mindset we should have too. The more experience you gain in this Christian life, the more you should be able to um, look on your problems and say, hey, what is this impossible hardship? What is this uncircumcised affliction that is coming my way? Like, it's just going to be like one of those things that God has, I've trusted God and is going to help me through it. Um, tr through it. And verse 40 of, uh, verse 40 of that verse in um, First Samuel chapter 17. It says, verse 40, and he took his staff in his hand and chose him five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag which he had even in a scrip and his sling was in his hand and he drew near the near the philistines see he went picked the right tool and went to tackle the job um so when when you need to improve something in your life when you need to get better at something and Picking the, uh, getting work experience is not just, oh, I have to go, so, uh, I'll just, just come outside and do so winning. It's that and also personal things in your life. The work experience is pretty much everything that you, things that you're supposed to do after getting saved. Every godly things that you have to do after getting saved. And if you ever think that, oh, well, I, I think I'm good. I, I don't think I have any job I need to, I don't think I have any personal thing I need to work on in my life. I will ask you to pray this prayer in Jeremiah chapter 15, 17, or something that God said, but I would like you to pray it. Jeremiah chapter 17 verse 10 says, I, the Lord, search the heart. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doing. So if you can pray this prayer, it says, that says, search, me, search my heart, O Lord, and give me according to my ways and according to the fruit of my doings. If you can pray that prayer clearly without something pricking inside you, that you can't fully make the prayer then that is the thing that you need to work on that is the thing that you need to that's the job you need to work on and you need to select the right tools to gain that experience so that you can help other people and so that you can grow yourself i pray that you guys were blessed and let's let's say short prayer in jesus name Amen. lord thank you lord for this evening lord as we go home take us home safely we pray lord that you know each and every one of us should assess our lives to you know choose work on what we need to work on and to use use what you've provided for us to help tackle all the problems that come our ways in jesus name amen, amen.